All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Shakia Taylor. This is Ballpark Figures. This is Dave Stewart. We're actually just going to go ahead and get to it. Thank you for waiting for us. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Let's, let, let's start at the beginning. You grew up in Oakland, which has like an incredible Black baseball history. Who else is from Oakland? Tell us about your Oakland baseball history. Did you say who else is from Oakland? Because yes, I want everyone. Oh, come on. You, you know, you know that. You know the answer to this question, so I think you tested me. Is what you do? No, I want people to hear from you. You're the voice I mean, tonight. You know, it, it, this starts all the way back to Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood is is a Bay Area native. He was the guy who innovated and started free agency in baseball. He's given every player in today's game the right to have beyond imaginable earnings. Um, and Kurt Flood did that, and he sacrificed his own career to do that. And then after Kurt Flood, there's Veda Pence and there's Frank Robinson, there's Willie Stargell, um, Joe Morgan. Um, and those are the, 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 those are the guys, though, the real OGs, I guess is what we call them. Mm -hmm. um, those were the guys who laid the path for us. And then after that, you know, in my period of time, there was Rupert Jones, who had a great major league career, Al Woods. Glenn Burke, um, who was the first openly gay player in Major League Baseball um, with the Los Angeles Dodgers and eventually the o Oakland A's, um, was from Oakland. Um, myself, Ricky Henderson, um, Lloyd Mosby, I mean, the, the, Gary Pettis, it, it just keeps going on and on and on. And that shows you the richness of the game of baseball in the period of time that I was coming up as a kid. Um, and as we continue to move on, C.C. Sabathia, Dontrell Willis, you know, if I keep thinking, I'm sure I'm going to come up with more Jimmy Rollins. That's the Bay Area. That's that's who we were. Um, mm -hmm. And those are the, the the that's the quality of players that we had coming out of the Bay Area. I feel like it's not talked about a lot. Like it's not talked about a lot. The talent that came out of, of Oakland, you know, um, what was that like for you being a kid from the area who came to play professional baseball there? You're kind of a legend, not kind of, you are a legend in Oakland. Well, if it had not been for Willie Mays and the San Francisco Giants, when I was young and growing up, uh, my father was a longshoreman, worked at Pacific Maritime in San Francisco. Uh, my father took me to my first baseball game in 1962. I'm born in 57, so you do the math on that. Uh, but it was that day. We went out to see the Giants play. The Giants were playing the Pittsburgh Pirates. And so that meant I also had an opportunity to see Roberto Clemente. And so when you you get out to see Willie Mays, who we all know that Willie Mays is probably one of the biggest sports figures ever in the game of baseball. And to have that opportunity to watch him do his thing on the baseball field. It was unbelievable. But even more importantly, my father said, we're going to get this bat signed after the game. And we waited hours and hours and hours. And Willie signed autograph after autograph after autograph. And I was one of the last ones to be signed. And that had an impact on my life. And I told my dad, if I ever had a chance to be a major league player, which my father thought that to be impossible at that time, I told him that I wanted to be the type of player that Willie Mays represented when it came to the fans. And um, it, it really had a, a, a profound uh, impact on me, community, and um, the fans. When I met you for the first time, I didn't say this, but like, I thought it was so cool that you were a member of the Black Aces. Um, like, I, it's just such a prestigious group. It's not, um, something that people hear about, I think, in contemporary baseball often. Um, but you won 20 or more games for four consecutive seasons. What was that like? Like, that just sounds, I don't know, unimaginable for me. Well, in this day and time of baseball, needless to say, I don't know that that will ever happen again. Mm-hmm. You know, but at that time, my heroes, when it came to pitching, were Don Newcomb, 
Bob Gibson, Fergie Jenkins. I love Vita Blue because he was right here in my hometown. And I looked at those guys as examples of what I wanted to be when it came to pitching. So it just so happened that Bob Gibson, I think, had won six in a row and Fergie Jenkins had done something crazy like seven or eight in a row. And after I won my first 20, um, I wanted to be one of those guys. And I thought that I'd have an opportunity to be one of those guys, beat their record, pitch, you know, and, and be a part of that fraternity of 20 game winners, but not just one time, but be consecutive 20 game winner. And obviously I fell, fell short on both those guys. Vida, as I said, he was, Vida actually was not the guy, but um, when you looked at Bob Gibson, as I said, I, I believe he won six in a row and Fergie seven or eight in a row. It was some ridiculous number. Mm -hmm. um, I fell short, but they were my inspiration at that time and trying to, to put together t consecutive 21 seasons. You've held many different positions um, throughout your career. You've been a player, you've been a scout, a pitching coach, a player agent, GM. Um, and throughout your career, you have talked a lot about diversity uh, in Major League Baseball and in baseball period. Um, how does that or those efforts motivate you today? And, you know, what, what are you working on today with regard to that? Well, you know, when you've gone through the things that I've gone through in baseball um, to, to try to achieve the position of general manager of a baseball team, um, and I went through a lot and, and had some difficulties in, in accomplishing that and being able to do that. Um, you, it, it's your duty to speak about the inequities in the game of baseball. And I did. I mean, even as a player, um, when I was coming up through the minor leagues, there were not very many black pitchers in the game. Um, as a matter of fact, there were few in the minor leagues. And at the time I made it to the big leagues, there was only one in the big leagues, and that was Al Downey. And so when, when I was coming up in the Dodgers organization and, and Al Downing was in the big leagues and I was in the minor leagues, being the only black pitcher in the minor leagues, Al Downing being the only one in the big leagues, um, I, I got to admit, I, I faced a lot and I went through a lot um, to try to, you know, just be a part. Mm -hmm. And so those things taught me lessons and, you know, this has been, in my opinion, this has been a game of, of pay it forward. Um, I had um, Al Downing at that time. Don Newcomb was the first person I met when I came into Dodgers camp. And he sat down with me and Roy Campanella and told me and taught me what it meant to not only just be a black pitcher in the game, be a black player in the game, but how to represent ourselves so that we would earn respect and then eventually be given respect. And so I came up at a time when, I don't even know how to put it. I mean, I came up at a time when um, we had an opportunity to pay it forward. I was surrounded by good people. I was surrounded by Reggie Smith, Davey Lopes, Dusty Baker, you know, a good group of people that believed in, in sharing, giving, but as I said, not just sharing and giving, but let me know that there's a responsibility that's given to me, to mm -hmm. others who are like me, who look like me and are in, in the game of baseball. And so, I mean, I got it earnestly from, from, from my mentors, friends, from my family. Um, I got it earnestly that, you know, you can't just be here and not share what you know, not uplift people, not be a good teammate, not be a good human being. And part of that is making sure that there's awareness of what our challenges are and how we can battle those challenges. Um, <clears throat> I know that as a part of you know, your efforts, you are currently working to help bring Major League Baseball to Nashville. Um, what's that been like for, just as an experience and what can you know, members of Sabre like, learn about that? You know, um, being an executive in baseball, which, and I don't even know how to explain it. I mean, I, I spent 
a lot of years as a major league baseball executive and being a part of the game and, and um, having the opportunity to really see the inside of major league baseball. And my last job was with the Arizona Diamondbacks. And after doing that job, I realized that the best opportunity and the best way to have impact in this game is through ownership. And, and I made it my goal if I if I could ever have that opportunity that I would want to be an owner. Um, I would want to represent people of color. Mm -hmm. I would also want to represent diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I mean, you know what time we're in at this at this point in time in our lives mm -hmm. and how valuable and how important it is to be able to, to have impact in those areas. Baseball may be the last sport. I've only been a part of baseball for only 48 years, but it may be the last sport in, in, in my impression and through my impressions, it hasn't really opened the door to the idea that the best ideas and the best way to come up with solutions, the best organizations are not by one race of people, they're by multiple races of people, multiple ideas. Um, and those that makes a great organization. And so the opportunity in Nashville came along and uh, through my relationships in baseball, I've tried to put myself in the best position to be the first black owned organization in baseball. And so I don't want you to misunderstand it. We're gonna be 51, 60, whatever that percentage is, is but we also stand for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So mm -hmm. everybody's welcome, but this will be the first time that a major league team has been led by an Afro-American, a black person. And I think that that's groundbreaking. I've talked to 18 owners. They believe that it's time for baseball to take their stance in that position because as you know, baseball has always said that they want to make a difference and they want to do things differently. You know, George Floyd brought up about a time that people had to reflect on what they were doing and what their practices were. But six months later, a year later, baseball is still doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so this offers an opportunity to have impact, not just in the game of baseball, but in the world that we live in and in their practices and how they go about their business. Um, I think that's tremendously important. And it's something that obviously touches me um, in a personal way as someone, you know, who is, um, a Black person connected to the sport. Um, and <clears throat> I think people hear, oh, Maureen said it's very cool. <laughs> Did you want to find somewhere to sit down? I know it's like you're like standing outside right you know, now. You know what? I think what I don't want to do is get into a place where we get into a bad cell signal zone. So I'm going to stay right here. Okay, okay. Um, to shift gears a little bit, we started getting questions and I feel like there are people who are probably waiting so if you guys have questions, throw your questions in the chat. I will I will get to them. I'm going back and forth between yours and mine. Um, I got like a bunch of messages earlier from different people. Uh, they really want you to talk about playing with Ricky Henderson. Um, I think <laughs> I <laughs> I was telling my the favorite guy, topic, quite frankly. <laughs> you know what? He called me today and we got an opportunity to talk for a little bit. And actually I owe him a call back. Ricky Henderson, and I've said this and I'll say this again, and I'll repeatedly say this, is the, he's in the top five players, in my opinion, to ever play the game. He's a great teammate, um, athletically talented. I've, I've known Ricky since I was 13 years old. So he's athletically talented, not just in baseball. He played football, could have been an all pro running back in the game of football. Um, but more importantly, you know, his display of playing a game until his into his 40s tells you how much he loved the game and how much impact he wanted to continue to have on the game. And when I talk to people about some of the independent league teams that he played on and his ability to mentor players, even at that level and how players looked up to him, that is an indication of the type of human being he is and how much he loves the game of baseball. And Ricky is one of my best friends in life. Um, he seems tremendous. And, you know, I'm like 
I don't know. I just can't imagine. I was, wasn't even really old enough to know what was going on <laughs> when you all were, were playing. And it's just so amazing. Like my parents are like, you're going to be talking to who? <laughs> so like hearing you talk about Ricky, like that's real awesome. Um, oh, Mel was there for your no hitter in Toronto, June of 1990. And they would like to know how did that feel? You tell Mel, I have had a thousand people or more than a thousand people tell me that they were at that game. So tell her she's not the only one that's told me she was at that game. <laughs> if the stadium held probably 45,000. I probably met through the years since that no-hitter about 70,000 people that have told me <laughs> they were at that game. But the, the truth is to pitch a no-hitter, um, and I got to tell the extended story of that. It was the worst pregame warmup that I've ever had. It was so bad that my pitching coach looked at me and he said, hey, Stu, this is going to be a tough one for you. He says, I can't believe that you're going to bring that. He used another word, but I'll, 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 I'll substitute the word stuff. He says, I can't believe you can bring that stuff into the game. And so I told Duck, I said, you know what, man, I'm just going to try to live with it and see what, I, what, what, it, what we come up with. He says, you know, sometimes good things come from the worst. And sure enough, first two hitters in the game, I walked them. And then uh, the next hitter, I was able to strike out and then get a double play and get out of that inning. We cruised. I shouldn't say we cruised. It was tough. I always had a hard time in my starts for the first three innings. And so once I got past the third inning and I realized that all my pitches were working and things were going well, you know, I had my slider in, intact, my fork ball was intact, my, my slider, which is the worst of my pitches, by the way, you know, I was throwing that with accuracy and excellence. And I told Dunk in the fifth inning, I said, Dunk, I said, I'm going to no hit these guys. And and Dunk says, well, don't talk about it. Show me. And so we went through, we got to that fifth inning. There were a couple of hard hit balls. Um, you know, McGuire made a play. One ball was hit deep to center field. Dave Henderson made a play. Um, but I think that those were the most difficult plays in the game. Then we got into the ninth inning. So it's not going to be a perfect game, right? So the first hitter to lead off is Junior Felix, which he has the ability, one, we're playing in an artificial surface. So he's got the ability, one, to hit the ball in that artificial surface and beat out a ground ball. But he also has enough pop in his bat to take me deep. So I got to decide prior to that at bat, what am I willing to do to continue, to, to, to continue that no hitter? Sure enough, I fall behind in the count to him, 2-0. and I work myself back into a count of 2-2. Then it went to 3-2. And on the 3-2 count, I step back off the mound and I tell myself, you know, I'm going to make the pitch, the pitch that I want to make. And if I don't make that pitch, then heck, I walk two people in the first inning. So it's not going to be a perfect game, but I'm not going to lose this no hitter. And I end up actually making a really nice pitch down and away, he's a left-handed hitter. I make a nice pitch down and away, and I swear to the day that the umpire missed that call, but I ended up walking him. Then I go on to get two more outs, and Tony Fernandez was the last out. But mentally, it was probably, it's just probably as tired as I've ever been in a baseball game. I was tired and exhausted for at least two days after that no-hitter. I really was. I was tired, but it was the greatest experience I've ever had. Um, and I'd have to say that individually, let me preface it, individual experience because when in the World Series and I had that opportunity to do that three times, I did it with the Dodgers, I did it with the A's and I did it with the Blue Jays. That is the best team experience I've ever had. Mm -hmm. But individual experience, throwing a no-hitter, I think there's nothing like that. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, the next question is, what is your advice for young people who want to get into the front office today? 
Woo-hoo. Get a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> and that's serious. I mean, you know, the game of baseball is what it is. Um, I think that the commissioner's office is trying to do the best that they can, you know, from their side to, to, to get people involved in the game and get people um, a part of the game, people of all races, colors, and creeds. They're trying to get people involved in the game and giving them an opportunity to be a part of the game. But the truth is, with, when you're trying to get affiliated with a major league club, it really helps to have a sponsor. Education pays, but if you've got a sponsor, somebody that you know, you know, consistently look at teams because teams are posting now job opportunities. And so most definitely make sure you, you take advantage of those opportunities when a job is posted. Um, John Capoala, who was eventually the general manager of the Atlanta Braves, sent me a resume when I was with the Toronto Blue Jays in 1999. Wow. Requesting an opportunity to do an internship for the Toronto Blue Jays. I reminded him of that a few years, a few days ago, actually. He came here to, to uh, Nashville to, to take a visit. And I reminded him of sending me that, uh, that resume and to do the internship. And then what do you know? I mean, years later, he ends up being the general manager of the Atlanta Braves. And so I would say, take advantage of all the opportunities. Teams are constantly posting job opportunities and internships. And those internships could turn into, you know, lifelong jobs. And it, it has happened. I can't say that it hasn't happened. But, I mean, the quickest route, obviously, and it's with any but business that you know, it's not always what you know. It's who you know. Mm-hmm. And that's the business of baseball. Um, Alex would like to know, how confident are you that Nashville will get an expansion franchise? I'm very confident. Uh, we stand for all of the right things. Um, and, you know, once again, I mean, what does that mean? Um, we stand for diversity, equity, and inclusion. One. Two, 75 years ago, Jackie Robinson ended the game of baseball. He broke the color barrier 75 years ago. Dusty Baker and Dave Roberts are the only two black managers in baseball. Up until this year, there were no general managers. Dana Brown became a black general manager since I had the position with the Arizona Diamondbacks and I was released from my job in 2016. And so when you look at that, the, those two pieces, ownership, general managers, the last piece of that is to have black ownership. And um, I believe that we will be able to check the boxes for that as well. And so I'm very confident. If you ask me today, uh, what percentage I think, I think we're 90% 90% a lot to get that opportunity because, I mean, the one thing that's going to get you a major league franchise is making sure that you have the finances to do it. And I believe that I'll be able to accomplish that. Um, <clears throat> Susan would like to hear from you on the A's situation and what appears to be <laughs> tanking on purpose. <laughs> everybody was wants to do, everybody wants to do about the A's. <laughs> And what I can tell you is this, because I am intimately involved in that as well. Um, and we can start back. You know, people look at the A situation as something that just recently happened, but it's not. Um, the trying to acquire a ballpark, new facility for the A's, that's been a 20 year saga for the A's organization, started back over 20 years ago, and it's been rejected. Um, It's not been accepted. And now we get to a place where Major League Baseball is asking that this happens. And they didn't put a deadline on the A's, but the A's contract is up in 2024. The Tampa Rays contract is up in 2027. And the Tampa Rays are already ahead, ahead of that curve, trying to find an opportunity for a new facility. The A's 20 years ago started this process and nothing came from it. You know, people will look at it and say the city of Oakland has come up with X amount of dollars to make this come to fruition. But, you know, it's gotten to now where it is. Time has run out, patience has run out. 
and the A's have tried to find another opportunity to make it happen. I'm not a big fan of them moving to Las Vegas. I'm a lifelong A's fan, but I'm also a lifelong A's player and a part of that franchise. And I recognize the history, the legacy of the organization, everything that's taken part of that organization since they came to Oakland. And so would I much rather they be in Oakland? Of course. Um, but it, it's looking like the opportunity for Oakland is now passing and that they're going to have to find another place to play. And it looks like Las Vegas is going to be the place. What are your views or your reactions to the pitch clock? <laughs> That's one you of know, our questions. Buddy. I, I appreciate the pitch clock. We didn't need a pitch clock when I played. I pitched a nine inning game in two hours and in one minute. I pitched a 13 inning game in two hours and 32 minutes. So we didn't have an issue or problem with pitch, with pitch clock, speeding up the game, doing the things that it took to keep the pace of the game good. Um, hitters take a long time. Pitchers take a long time to make a pitch. And I think the pitch clock has been very successful in my opinion. 30 minutes of a game. Thank goodness for that, because now it makes the game a faster pace game. And one of the things that people are saying that watch baseball as fans, especially our newer generation, is that the pace of the game is too slow. They want it to speed up. Well, now that's happening. It has. It's, it's, I mean, you can't be late for a game now. Um, <laughs> I that's true. It's like a game. Mike Tyson fight. Yes. <laughs> you cannot be late or it's over. That's right. <laughs> Um, you started out, well, we started out uh, by talking about like a bunch of great players that came out of Oakland. And Jason wants to know, do you think teams are doing enough to look for talent there today? In Oakland? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I can't really answer that question if I'm going to be honest. I don't know. Um, I'm not on the scouting side. Um, I do know because my wife is a is a uh, an agent, a certified agent, and she looks for talent. Um, and so she has, she's kind of in the heartbeat of what's happening in all areas. Mm -hmm. I know that the talent has been a little bit down in the, in the bear when it comes to talent. Um, and and so, um, I would say that, you know, Oakland is not a small area. It, it's it's not. It's a, it's a large area. So I think that the scouts are doing what they can when it comes to scouting areas. I think that the talent isn't just there. But I'll tell you something else. You also have the area code games. And the area code games put you in a position that all teams are represented and all areas are represented. That would be Northern California, Southern California, Texas, all areas are represented. And so you have several opportunities to see talent. So no, I think, I think the, the scouts are in the area. It's just not a lot of talent in the Bay Area. It's not like it used to be. Do you get many opportunities to go to games as a fan? And if so, when's the last time you went to a game and you were just there to watch the game? It's been a long time, I'll be honest. Um, I watch baseball games now, not because, you know, I work for NBC Sports. Mm -hmm. um, because for me, it's just a whole lot easier to sit at my couch and watch baseball games. And, and Shakia, you, like I said, you know my wife. So she'll tell you that I'll turn on a baseball game if it's on at 1 o'clock, if it's on at 12 o'clock, if it's on at 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. If I'm sitting in front of a TV, I'm watching. Thought I was gone, didn't you? <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's fine. I lost, I lost my battery. It's fine. I figured that was the case because I texted you too. And I was like, well, he's That's talking That's exactly anything. what happened. Battery went dead. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I apologize to everybody. They're good. They were asking me questions while we waited. Um, let's see. We, got, we did get some more questions for you. Um, 89 A's versus 93 Blue Jays. Who was the better team? Ooh, that's a tough question. So, you know, I always base everything on pitching. Um, pitching, I think, makes the difference in winning and losing. And uh, however your starting rotation is 
from your middle relievers to your bullpen, your closer is going to determine how good your team is. Um, and it's really tough for me to say because our starting rotation in Toronto in 93 was myself, Jack Morris, who's a Hall of Famer, uh, Pat Hinkin, Todd Stottlemyre, and Juan Guzman, on which all of those guys were very good. But I'm going to tell you what, 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 what really made us good, even though we were still in that period of time, eight, seven, seven eight, nine inning pitchers. We had Dwayne Ward and we had uh, Tom Henke and those guys could either one, they were changeable pieces that could have closed for us. And then we had Danny Cox in the middle relief with the host of uh, Mike Timlin, uh, who was a 95, 96 mile an hour sinker baller. So we had guys that could close baseball games out. And so maybe what I'll do is I'll go through our lineup and so we had Robbie Alomar, we had uh, John Olerud and Paul Molitor were our one, two, and three hitters. And those guys finished one, two, and three in the American League Batting Championship that year. We had Joe Carter, who was right in that mix. And so, I mean, we had a very, very potent um, lineup. Devo White was our center fielder. He was a gold glove center fielder. Uh, Tony Fernandez was our shortstop. Uh, Ed Sprague played third base for us and Pat Borders was our catcher. So, I mean, that's a pretty reputable lineup when you look at it and you think about it. Um, Cito Gaston, uh, which I always credit and give credit to the manager, um, was very good at managing, managing us mixing and making matches, um, letting the players play. He had the respect of the players and we wanted to play for him. Mm -hmm. um, Tony La Russa, who was our manager in uh, Oakland, Hall of Fame manager. And then when you think about it, it was myself, Bobby Welch, Mike Moore, Kurt Young, Storm Davis in 1989. Um, Storm Davis in our fifth role as a starter won 19 games. Dennis Eckersley was at the back end. We had Rick Honeycutt was our lefty specialist and another lefty Joe Klink. God, Todd Burns. I mean, once again, our bullpen was very, very solid and we won a lot of baseball games in 1989. Now, I don't know. I mean, when you look at our lineup, Ricky Henderson as I already said, was, in my opinion, one of the top five players to ever played Major League Baseball. Carney Lansford, right behind him. Then we get to the real power, which is Jose Canseco, Mark McGuire, Dave Parker. But we could change those pieces because if it wasn't Dave Parker, then it could be Harold Baines. And so, I mean, when you really start Terry Steinbach, Tony Phillips, Mike Gallego, Walter Weiss. I mean, the mix of players that we could throw at you and not just those guys, our bench players, our role players were great role players that allowed us the opportunity to give our frontline guys a chance to get rest so that we could win. I think we won over a hundred games that year as well. So I think if I was going to give an edge to a team, I'd have to give it to the Oakland A's because our role players and our bench was a better bench. If you match player for player, position for position, I think that our teams were pretty much equal in that area. I think our starting pitching would have probably been equal. I give a slight edge to our bullpen, although Toronto's bullpen was very good, but very, very slight. Uh, but where we beat the Toronto Blue Jays are our role players, the people that come off our bench. And people underestimate those guys because um, they, they think that they don't start every day. Mm -hmm. But those role players are the guys that allow your everyday players to be good, to be healthy, to perform at top performance on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a 162-game schedule. You played in a lot of rivalries and pennant races. Are there any of those matchups that stand out to you as particularly intense? 
And I'm gonna put after that question, I want you to know that a few people who are watching have told me that they could not stand you when you were pitching against their teams. So I want you to keep that in mind. Gotta be a whole lot of Boston fans out there because I enjoy putting my foot in Boston, but. <laughs> Are there any any matchups that stand out to you as intense? You know, Boston was an intense was an intense rivalry, and it became intense when it started in 1986. My first uh, start with the Oakland A's, my first real start with the Oakland A's was against Roger Clemens, and. Uh, I pitched against Roger Clemens on a day when he had an opportunity to create history in the game of baseball. And I don't know exactly what that was. You would have to look that up, but it had something to do with starts and wins. And I broke that streak and um, ended up beating Boston. It was Tony La Russa's first game as our Oakland A's manager. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that rivalry continued on. Um, Tony continued to make matchups against Roger. Um, I continued having good success against Roger, beating Roger. And, you know, and I, I, when I say beat Roger, it's difficult to say that because you pitch against the team. Mm -hmm. And I pitch against Boggs and Jody Davis and Greenwell and Boggs, Greenwell and Evans and Rice. Those are in Gedman. Those are the guys that I pitch against. And so, Technically, my job is to try to keep them from scoring runs so that we can score runs. Mm -hmm. And so, but it just happened that Roger was on the other side and we would score one more run or two more runs, but he would end up being on the losing end. And that turned out to be a very, very strong rivalry through the years. It really did. And it's one that I, I enjoyed because, you know, if I didn't say that Roger made me a better, better pitcher, I wouldn't be telling the truth. Mm -hmm. When I knew Roger Clemens was on the other side, that meant that it was going to be a close baseball game and I had to bring my A game. This was not a day to have an off day. Mm -hmm. This is a day to bring your A game to the ballpark and make sure that when you get to the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, and what I call the winning innings, which are the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings, that Roger at some point is gone because when Roger leaves the game, that means that I'm winning the baseball game. And, and that's, that was my mentality at that time. And that rivalry became a very, very strong rivalry. Are there any other pitchers that, you know, that come to mind is like in that way, like that you felt competing against them made you a better pitcher or there was just, you know, you're, you're going toe to toe with like the best. So you were definitely oh, making sure you were. Shakia, you have to remember. Um, I know I, you pitched at a time. <laughs> I pitched, I pitched against every team's number one or number two. Mm -hmm. I very seldom, seldom saw a five mm -hmm. or a four. Mm -hmm. You know, on the other side was going to be Jack Morris. On the other side was going to be Frank Viola. On the other side was going to be Dan Petrie. On the other side was going to be Frank Tanana. On the other side was going to be Ron Guidry. I'm facing those guys every time I take the mound. And so each one of them offered an opportunity to me to show my best. And, um, you know, Tony, it's, it's funny how relationships work because when we were um, first coming together in the 86 season, he always told me after a few starts that you're going to be my guy, you're going to be my go-to guy. And you need to start looking at every opportunity when you're pitching against Finley or Viola or Morris or Petrie or Clements, that these are opportunities to practice big games, playoff type games, mm -hmm. because the crowd is going to be into these games. The pressure is going to be on. They're going to be low scoring games. Practice it so that when we get there and you're my number one guy, you're going to be ready. And I, I took that to heart and I remembered it. And um, I think that those situations, the, the, the guys that I was facing, Tony La Russa, um, they made me better. Dave Duncan made me better, my pitching coach. He made me better. They made me take a different way of looking at competition and 
responsibility. More important, I think it was responsibility, responsibility to my team and the guys that were playing behind me. They gave me an opportunity to look at it in a totally different way. Um, one of my favorite stories of yours, I don't know if other people here know it, so I'm gonna ask you to tell it. Um, <laughs> I heard it in person, but I saw it in uh, Reggie Jackson's documentary. What is it like growing up watching him and then he is now your friend? Like, you know, how? To, to say he's my friend, I think is that, that's selling our relationship short. Okay. Reggie's, Reggie's my brother. Love it. Um, I met Reggie. In the 1968 season, and once again, I'll tell you, do the math. I'm born in 57, <laughs> and so that makes me 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And I met Reggie um, as a little kid with my relatives, my cousin Kevin, my cousin Daryl. Um, we we were sneaking into the Oakland Coliseum and hiding out in the seats, collecting baseballs for all the balls that were being hit in the seats during batting practice. And Reggie standing out in the outfield and recognized that we were, we were doing what we were doing. And he turned his back to the infield and he looked up, waiting for us to pop our heads up. Ball was hit up and we pop our heads up. And Reggie hollers, and I'll tell you the story, he says, he hollers and he says, hey, you know old man Philly will put you out of this ballpark. And my cousin Kevin, he says, yeah, right. Put us out of the ballpark. It could keep us from coming in the ballpark. <laughs> and so, you know, that was a sign that Finley was cheap. There was no security. Couldn't keep us from coming in the ballpark. And, and, and Reggie eventually, after going back and forth, paid attention to bat and practice. After the game, Rick Mundy had hit a home run. My cousin and I, we were around now on the player side, which is even a better indication that there's no security because where the players are coming out, we're standing there. <laughs> and so Rick, uh, Rick Mundy comes out and my cousin, uh, Daryl asks him, you know, can you, can you sign this baseball? And uh, Rick looks at us and he says, you have school tomorrow? And we all say yes. And he says, do you know what time it is? And he looks at my cousin, Daryl, do you know what time it is? And so my cousin, Daryl, he does like this. He says, do I look like I'm wearing a watch? <laughs> and so Rick Mundy says, well, I'm gonna tell you what time it is. It's 1030. You guys need to be at home. You got school tomorrow. You need to be at home. And he doesn't sign the baseball. He tells us to go home and he walks away. And so Reggie is the last player to come out. And so when he comes out, all three of us, we're walking ahead of him, but I guess he recognizes who we are from our backs. And he says, hey, hey. He says, oh, you those little smart asses. <laughs> and so we turn around and he says, no, nah, man, we were just doing, trying to get baseball, boom, boom, boom. And he walks up to us. He says, so where do you guys live? We told him, well, I live right down the street from the ballpark. I live about two or three blocks from the ballpark. I said, I live two or three blocks. My cousin, Kevin and Daryl, they lived on 73rd and Arthur, which is about another probably six or six to eight blocks. And so um, he says, well, how did you guys get to the game? He says, you guys are walking. How'd you get to the game? He said, well, we rode our bicycles. We rode it to Union 76 station on 66, and we chained our bikes up. We hopped the fence, and then we were in the ballpark. And so that's how we got here. So he said, well, so you guys are, you guys are walking right now? I said, we got to walk back to our bikes. He said, you want to ride? And I said, no, nah, we can't take a ride because my mother told me we shouldn't take rides from strangers. And so he literally, as we were walking back to our bicycles, slow drove until we got to our bikes. And then when we got to our bikes, he slow drove behind us. They stayed at my house that night, he spent the night at my house that night. 
and drove until we got to my house. And then he took off. And that Amazing. started a relationship. Um, Amazing. And started a relationship. You know, some people, you know, if you know Reggie, some people will say, wow, that doesn't sound like Reggie Jackson because Reggie is different on different days. And what I found out when you have that type of fame, that type of popularity, that type of celebrity, you know, people are coming at you all the time and people drain your energy when they're coming at you all the time. And so people have different, different things to say about Reggie, some negative, some positive. Well, mine is not just a positive story. It's a story of really, at that time, changing my life. Mm -hmm. uh, my father now, because I'm going to Oakland Games, is now passed. And it's me who's got six sisters and an older brother. And um, to have that type of example from a male, black male, mm -hmm. um, was very, very important to me at that time. And to take the time that he did, because that wasn't the end of it. Reggie started leaving us tickets, started giving us rides home. And he, re he really became uh, an example for me at that time in my life and it was important. And we became friends at that moment. We lost some, we lost some time because, you know, obviously I went on to play major league baseball and in that period of time in the minor leagues and Reggie being in the big leagues, leaving A's and eventually going to the Yankees. Mm -hmm. The next time I saw Reggie, probably from the time I was 17 until I was 23, um, was the first time we played the Yankees in the World Series in 1981. That's and, incredible. I don't think I knew that. Yep, yeah, we played the Yankees in 1981. It was the first time I saw Reggie. He had a bad series in New York and offensively. Mm -hmm. And when we got to, to Dodger Stadium, he was there early taking batting practice, taking swings and trying to improve his game. And at that time, now I got I got a son that was born in '77, Adrian, and we're coming into the stadium. And I thought it would be good one to reunite with Reggie because I hadn't seen him in many years, and now I also have a family. So when I'm coming in to Dodger Stadium and he's hitting, he finally takes a step out because we were waiting for him to finish his preparation. And he finally steps out. And when he steps out, he looks, he looks at me and he, he knows that I'm a Dodger player, but he doesn't recognize me because mm -hmm. I'm a grown man now. Right. I, got, I, I got a kid, you know, when I was then, you know, I was all of five, nine, five, 10. And, um, and now I'm a six, two grown man. Mm -hmm. And so he's looking at me and I walk up to him and I said, Reggie, I said, can you do me a favor? Would you mind signing an autograph for my son? I'd grabbed a baseball and would you take a picture with him? And he looks at me and he says, you think I'm going to take a picture with you? You play for the other team? You competing against me? He says, you are the enemy. He says, you want, me to, you want me to stop my preparation to take a picture with you and you are trying to beat me? He said, what position you play? I said, I pitch. He said, not only are you trying to beat me as a team, but you're going to be pitching against me. You're going to try to get me out? He says, I'm not taking no picture with you. And so I stepped back. I said, Reggie. I said, this is Stu. And so he, his eyes kind of widen. And he says, little Stu? <laughs> I said, yeah, little Stu. And he said, give me a hug. He says, this is your son? I said, yeah, man, this is my son. He says, he about the same age that I was when I met you. I said, no, no, no. He's a little bit behind that, Reggie. He's much younger. He said, man, I can't believe this is you. He said, I had no idea that you were playing for the Dodgers. He says, you know, I look at all of the pitchers and the people that play for the Dodgers. He says, he says, I never put your name 
that this was you. I said, it's me, man. Took, took a picture with my son, signed an autograph ball. And from 1981, literally, Reggie and I talked yesterday. We have never lost communication with each other. Um, he has been, he's been my brother. He really has. He's been as close to family to me as I can possibly have family. That's what Reggie Jackson has represented for me. That's an amazing story. Thank you so much for telling us. And oh, thank God. you so it's much for, go ahead. There's two parts because there was okay. the child and then there was the adult. And I haven't really told the adult side of it very much um, because the truth is the real impact started for me when I was when I was a little kid trying to be a baseball player in Oakland and uh, Reggie filled some gaps that were missing in my life. And, and I would never forget him for that. And I'm so grateful for him being a part of my life at that time. This, I, I mean, Oh, look, everyone is in the chat. Like incredible story. That's a heck of a story. Like I told you, that was like amazing. Um, <laughs> I don't have any more questions and I don't think anyone else has any more questions. Thank you so much for doing this with us. It was the best, truly. I, I had the best time. Thank you so much. I, I gotta leave you, I gotta leave you with one more, one more okay. before we go. Okay. And I think you'll love this one because it was my first major league game. And you know, I, I'd come up in 1978 and Lasorda was our manager. Um, and as most of you will know, it was the, the great infield of Davey Lopes and, and Steve Garvey. And um, we had Bill Russell at shortstop and we had Ron Safe and, and Steve Yeager. That was an infield that had played together for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Reggie Smith was in right field. Rick Mundy was in center field. How about that? I got a chance to play with Rick Mundy again. And I told him about the time he didn't sign the ball for me. And Dusty Baker was playing left. And so um, my first game, when I got there, Bert Hooten and, and Don Sutton, you know, they told me, they said, you know, you got to be ready. Um, you got to be ready because Lasorda will put you in games in situations that you're not going to be ready for. And I said, okay, well, okay, just be ready. So sure enough, Bert Hooten gets hurt. We're playing the Padres. Bird Hooten gets hurt. I come into a game with the bases loaded and no outs. That's the, my first major league game. Okay. And so, you know, I'm face, facing my first hitter. And I throw two pitches inside that were way inside. They were barely, almost not catchable. And so Lasorda comes out and he says, he called me Smoke. He said, hey, Smoke, you, you need to calm down. Just, just calm down. These guys, they put their pants on just like you do. Did right. you get me out of this inning? I need you to calm down and just throw strikes. And so I end up getting the first out on a strikeout, get an infield fly ball, and then I get a ground ball to shortstop, and I get out of the inning. They pitch in for me, and I'm out of the game. So we're staying at a place called the Town and Country mm -hmm. in San Diego. And I'm, I'm coming back to the hotel. And I hear a voice. And it's Lasorda. Hey, Smoke. Hey, Smoke. He says, come over here, Smoke. I want to talk to you. Come over. He says, Smoke, sit down. I want to talk to you. So I sit down. He said, hey, Smoke. Let me ask you a question. When you walk a guy, what happens? I mean, it seems like a simple question, right? Right. You walk, <laughs> he goes to first base. So Lasota says, that's not what happens when you walk a guy, Smoke. I said, what happens, Lasota? He says, Smoke, let me tell you. So you walk the guy. He said, that guy tosses his bat, puts his bat and gloves in his back pocket, He's going down the first baseline, a slow trot. He says, somewhere between home plate and first base, he says, that guy, he starts grabbing at his shirt. His eyes start bucking out of his head. He says, Smoke, he was standing upright. All of a sudden, he's in a crouch, and he's now almost crawling to first base. 
He says, smoke, slob is coming out of the side of his mouth. He says, smoke, right before he gets to first base, one arm's length from first base, he dies. I said, okay. He said, smoke, do you know what happened? I says, I said, Tommy, no, what happened? He says, they could pinch run. I said, okay. So he says, Smoke, what happens if you throw a ball and the guy puts the ball in play? He gets a base hit, maybe even a double. I said, he gets a double. He says, Smoke, that's not what happens. I said, what happens, Sorta? He says, Smoke, that ball's hitting the gap. That same guy is running down that first baseline. He's hauling ass down that first baseline. Some place between home plate and first base, that guy starts grabbing his shirt. His eyes start bucking out of his head. Smoke, he ain't running so fast no more. Now he's crawling. Within one arm's length of first base, he dies. Davy Lopes gets a relay from Reggie Smith in right field. The ball gets to Davy. He throws the ball over to Garvey at first base. Garve's got that ball at first base. That guy is laying one arm's length from first base. Dead, Smoke. Do you know what happens? I said, what happens, Sutter? He says, you can tag his dead ass out. I did not so, know it going. So he said, Smoke, whatever you do, throw strikes. I said, I got it, Sutter. <laughs> That's my first game in the big leagues. Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate Thank you guys you. having me on, Shaquille. Thank you for having me on. This has been fun. I'm sorry for the interruptions and I'm sorry for being late, but I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Why we had a blast? My eyes are burning from laughing now. <laughs> Take care. I'm gonna log out. See you guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye.